Hello everyone, my name is Harvey Brownstone and today our special guest is a Hollywood legend. She made her Broadway debut in 1966 in Barefoot in the Park and in 1971 she received a Theatre World Award and a Tony nomination for Best Actress for the School for Wives. But she's best known for her award-winning portrayal of Valine Ewing, first on Dallas and then for 13 seasons on Knott's Landing from 1979 to 1992. Since then, She's co-starred in The Young and the Restless and numerous movies and TV shows, including Touched by an Angel, The Nanny, and Nip Tuck. She's one of the most popular and beloved actresses in Hollywood. She is, of course, the incomparable Joan Van Ark. Joan, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, this is a wrap because you can't top the intro. You did. That was every bit. And the Tony nomination, which I'm the most proud of, of course, because that's the real deal. Not that the other things aren't, but that's special. And so are you, thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Joan, one of the many amazing things about you is that you were accepted at the Yale School of Drama right out of high school without even getting an undergraduate degree. I understand that Julie Harris recommended the school to you when you were only 15? Yes, I actually, my father was a writer for Time and Life magazine. And somehow he put together uh, for the Denver Post, uh, either that or the Rocky Mountain News, one of the two Denver, Colorado newspapers where I grew up. What happened was we knew she was coming through on tour. And I, I wanted so desperately to meet her because she's obviously an icon, four or five Tonys under her belt. God bless her. God rest her soul. So my father arranged that I would uh, interview with her between matinee and evening performance in Denver and I did so and it was unbelievable and I was 15 years old and I thought I'm going to take the opportunity to myself I thought I want to ask her I don't want to waste four years of college all I eat sleep and drink is acting and roles and different parts where how what could I do to specialize my training and she suggested the Yale School of Drama because she went at 18, right out of her high school, to Yale as the first woman to do that. And God was good. And I became the second woman after Julie Harris to go to Yale straight out of high school. I was awarded a scholarship. So my heart went, my actress heart went to the sky. I love the fact that Julie Harris ended up playing your mother on Knott's Landing. Now that's, oh, that's karma, that, don't you think? Beyond karma. I just got chills from that because it's serendipity and it's when the big important things happen, things happen the right way and for a reason. And if they're not the right way at the moment, you will see that down the line, it was the right way. So, I mean, it was just so special and so wonderful to learn when I thought they said, we've cast your mother for Knott's Landing, David Jacobs, the uh, executive producer, and Michael Feilerman, uh, co-producer. Um, they said, we, we found someone, we've got, we're going to have a, a series regular, and she will be your mother. And I thought, oh dear, hold your breath. Is it going to be Jaja Gabor, Eva Gabor? Which one of the Gabor <laughs> sisters is it going to be? And sure enough, it turned out they said Julie Harris. And I lost it. I lost it and skipped down the hall, down the stairs, and back to the stage to finish my day's work. My heart was in the sky. It was meant to be. Oh, absolutely. Well, as a young actress, you co-starred in Death of a Salesman with Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy. I want to ask you, was it intimidating to share the stage with these iconic actors when you were so young? Yes, I was young. It was my first professional job. I got my equity card going to the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. Sir Tyrone Guthrie himself directed several of the plays of which I was in. But Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy made it uh, comfortable somehow. And she is, you know, she was, she's just, you know, full of uh, charm and grace and elegance and all that. But Hume invited me in because he did the miser, the lead role in Moliere's The Miser. And Hume would invite me in to watch him transform from Hume Cronin into the miser. And he did it, which is the stagecraft thing is to, you step into character and you become whatever it is that you need to be. You get in there by putting on that face. It's the biggest journey for an actor. For me to share that time with Hume Cronin before going 
on stage and doing this brilliant performance and we were playing doors. I mean, it was, it couldn't have been, I couldn't have been more peripheral. And yet he was maybe my second year at Yale because I left Yale after one year because the Guthrie Theater offered me to be uh, not resident ingenue, but the next best thing. So the young, the young idiot or whatever. So that was a, that was a gift too. In 1972, you co-starred with another legend, Betty Davis, in The Judge and Jake Weiler. She you do know. You do know. Oh, I know your entire career, believe me. Now, Betty Davis sometimes had the reputation of being difficult on the set, but I understand she helped you enormously in the role of Alicia Dodd. Well, I didn't even remember that's her name, Alicia Dodd. She is the one who murdered her husband, Forzimani. So... The first scene I did was in the lawyer's office trying to play the grieving widow. And we did a couple rehearsals, uh, as you always do, and then you go, you know, finish your makeup and la da la da la. And I didn't know, but she was standing right over watching the whole rehearsal. And I was not comfortable. It didn't feel right. I felt like I was reaching not to show that I'm the widow, that I'm the murderer, but the grieving widow instead. She motioned to me to come over to her, and I do kind of uh, breathless, wondering how to breathe even. And she got the wardrobe person, and the wardrobe person, she told her, go bring her a black hat with a black veil. And the wardrobe woman within an instant had, you know, did that. And suddenly, all I had to do was play the scene and do nothing, which is, I've been told many times, do nothing, because I'm going like a house on fire usually. And she saved me in that scene, and she's in my heart forever, in my actress heart, uh, for helping me when I had heard exactly what you had, was like, look out, she's, you know, she's tricky, or, you know, can get very pushy, push away. And she was anything but, she was embracing, and I, I treasure her. And then in 1988, you co-starred with B. Arthur and Richard Kiley in a wonderful TV movie called My First Love. I just loved that film. And I wondered if you had any special memories of working with B. Arthur. Oh, no, just that she had that voice that I can't even do. It's so rich and low and fabulous and very together and uh, professional and all the things you would expect to come out of that voice and out of that wonderful, wonderful actress. But I, 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 there's not a lot. I remember I had to wear skimpy, a lot of several skimpy outfits. That was one thing. Uh, but everybody on the set was, it, it was comfortable. I, I don't have any, oh, oh, well, careful or tiptoe or any of that. I didn't, I didn't feel that. It was a high profile uh, movie at the time, TV movie at the time, but it didn't get in the way of the work. And Joan, while we're talking about your TV movies, in 1990, you starred in another one of my absolute favorites. It was called Always Remember I Love You with David Burney and Patty Duke about a teenage boy who was adopted but discovers he was stolen from his biological parents and he runs away to find them. Your portrayal of the adoptive mother was just heartwarming. I loved you in that. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And you know, it's funny, you are mentioning every show that I have pictures of down in my office just because it's my memorabilia and it's the fiber of the blanket of Joan Van Ark, the weave, the blanket weave of the characters. Patty Duke was, again, wonderful, inclusive, collaborative, just, you know, it's amazing. When you come on a set with those who whose body of work, I, I understand Clint Eastwood as a director says, when you're ready to the actors, instead of screaming action. And you know, I'm like a horse at the starting gate. I, I jump first and then run. But he would just say, when you're ready. And it's gentle. All the best actors and actresses, it, it, you find that it, it's a weave and it's almost effortless. Bill Devane was that way on Knott's Landing. It's just, they're there. They're right there for you, and you trade, and you trade, and you trade, and it's a circle. Joan, although people think of you as a TV star, you're a highly accomplished stage actress. You've appeared in The Miser, Death of a Salesman, 
Barefoot in the Park, The School for Wives, The Rules of the Game, Three Tall Women, The Exonerated, it's so many more. Do you have a preference as between doing stage productions and doing film and television? Well, the one thing I love about stage is you have time to be pregnant, meaning you rehearse and you find and you dig out the nuggets of what is truly the character and who you are in the play. And it's, it's more examined work now and now more than ever, the new normal, more than ever, it's stay fluid and by the seat of your pants because it's on mock speed. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're geared into that rhythm. And so stage allows you the pregnancy to build the character and build it in the right way with layers and moments and nuances. I love the fact that you refer to it as a pregnancy because you really are delivering a performance when you're on the stage from beginning to end. Whoa, very good. I'll, I, I think I'll use that one. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, and I also want to point out that you won a Los Angeles Drama Critics Award for As You Like It. You've also played Lady Macbeth and Roxanne and Cyrano de Bergerac, and you did Stephen Sondheim's A Little Night Music. Joan, you've said the stage is your church, and you're incredibly versatile, and I think that versatility has been the key to your longevity, don't you? Well, I wonder, because things are changing so now, and everything is cable. They're brave. They're doing, they're doing what theater gave us, or gave some of us, and, and the actors as well, something a little... I don't want to say richer, but something that it allows a li uh, just a breath or two or three to be taken. Now it's whip out. If you don't fall off the stool in the bar scene, print, move on. So it, it's, um, it's just a way different rhythm. Prior to getting the role of Valine on Dallas in 1978, you had already been on two other soap operas. You were in two episodes of Peyton Place in 1968. I and forgot. You, you know things I don't even... <laughs> and you played Janie Whitney in 17 episodes of Days of Our Lives in 1970. And then you did 54 episodes playing Gloria Abbott in The Young and the Restless in 2004 and 2005. Did you get a lot of fulfillment as an actress in playing the same character for such a long time and making her grow and evolve? If you've got a character for the short term things you just mentioned, no, it's kind of fun to fill in the blanks and that it doesn't, Valine was a challenge. And I know a challenge for the writers to write, what, seven, eight, nine characters every week with more secrets revealed, so to speak. And I, Michelle and I always felt that Knots was not really a soap. It was an on running, ongoing, and it went for what, 14, 15 years. It was a drama series. Yes, I think it was more that. And just like it was a precursor to some shows that would come and happen down the road. Maybe it was before its time, but uh, uh, it, it was a, a unique show in its own little category. And the followers of Knots Landing are about as loyal a group as you could ever imagine. I mean, they've stayed with it. But for the short term uh, uh, shows you, you mentioned, that list, I, I didn't ever find that a, um, a, a pushback. It was something that wasn't so long that it became a problem. Now, how do I justify? Because they gave you the script and they took you places, but it never got repetitive. It did perhaps on knots, although they had me cooking crawdads one night to give the twins and Gary for dinner, which I think is, you know, Valine had, had a tendency to go off the deep end. And one of those deep end trips <laughs> involved me cooking crawdads for dinner. And... <laughs> I still to this day don't know. I even marched up to the uh, writer's office and said, what in the world? But I went ahead and did it anyway. <laughs> yes, I remember that crazy scene where you were stir frying the children. Stir frying, her yes. Oh my they God. were uh, hermit crabs that you were stir frying. I remember oh, I thought that. it was crawdads. Well, maybe those are the same things. Crawdads could be hermit crabs in disguise. <laughs> but now we're into... Dallas and then Knott's Landing. You played Valine for 13 seasons on Knott's Landing. Now, Valine had a chaotic life, to say the least, and I think she demonstrated real strength to endure everything that she went through. But I have to ask you, were there times that you got the feeling that the writers were testing you? Oh, I do. That's the crawdads or whatever the heck they were, hermits, hermit <laughs> crabs. Was Peter Dunn your favorite writer? Oh, I loved Peter. I loved Peter. 
I love David. I just saw David, what, three days ago at a party. Definitely Peter Dunn. Is there any part of Valine's personality that resembles the real Joan Van Ark? Anything at all? That's a wonderful question. And believe it or not, I don't think I've ever... Oh boy, you're gonna make me verklempt what I thought of, what I thought of. <laughs> well, why shouldn't you be verklempt? I am. Oh, not now you're not. You might be, you, when this is over, when the interview is over, you might be. I am married to my high school sweetheart. I met him when I was 14 years old, Boulder High School in Boulder, Colorado. I went through, you know, Yale and uh, then the Guthrie and then went to London for Barefoot in the Park and all over the globe, practically. Meanwhile, we would meet and then go and then meet and then come again, together again, whatever. The high school sweetheart, John Marsilio in Boulder, who became John Marshall, the anchor and reporter for KNBC News in LA, what has been my husband for many, many years. Since and, 1966. Oh my God, don't do the math. All you people at home, God bless you, just don't do the math. <laughs> Okay, onward. You should be proud of that. That is an amazing- Well, it is and it isn't because during COVID when you're uh, isolated in just the house, uh, I don't know if loving hands at home and all that stuff that it's supposed to be, you know, it's like pets, even dogs start to growl a little bit. So that's a super test. When you, if you survived, if a marriage survived the, the isolation chapter of COVID, then you're in great shape. A lot of divorces happen. But the bottom line is that Gary and Val in Knott's Landing got married three times, three different times, because they met they, very young, like 14-year-old Joan Van Ark, and, and was separated and then came back and da 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 My husband and I have been married 4,000 years. Gary and Val became married at, uh, you know, 4,000 years. So that part is, and I see and talk to Ted, and we had coffee until he moved. He sends me every birthday, it has to be a $5,000 arrangement of Casablanca, white Casablanca flowers. That's Ted Shackelford to Joan Van Ark. And it's like, you have no idea, because I'd rather have flowers than food, uh, totally. And it, it, they fill our bar, our horseshoe bar, they fill the whole corner. They're to die for. That's Gary and Val, and Joan Van Ark and John Marshall. That's a similar thing right there. Absolutely. Wow, that's so touching. And I have to tell you, of all the episodes you did playing Valine, there's one scene in season six where you transform yourself from Valine to Verna Ellers by washing your face in front of the mirror and changing characters before our eyes. Joan, that was just incredibly fearless. It was a master class in acting. It was truly unforgettable. I just had to tell you how I felt about that scene. Well, I can't, you know, that, that you have no idea what that means. It wasn't written that way, but I said to David Jacobs, the best way and to the wonderful director, Larry Ellican, who was the, the director of our best, I think our best, certainly my best work, I loved him. He was an actor's director. I said, you know, the way to really make this believable, because then I had to go play Verna Ellers, the waitress, where, where I did uh, get the, the Southern accent back. So I had to go from Valine Goody Two Shoes, who didn't look Goody Two Shoes. She wanted to look like Abby with the hair out to here and the dark red lipstick and all the things that aren't Valine, that aren't Joan. She had to transition into that. I said, the best way if we could somehow do it and talk about teamwork, because you say fearless and I love that word and God bless you, God love you, because the crew had to be fearless too. Because I said, once I wash my face, because the, the producer said, okay, let's give it a try. I said, but okay, but once I wash my face, that's a wrap because to start all over again, take two hours <laughs> and plastic surgeons to, try that, to come back to uh, Valine and start at point A. We had one false start, which happened as I got in the bathroom and lining up with the mirror. And after the one false start, I went back to the bed where I was lying down in the motel room and action was called and I said a prayer and up I got and I walked in, I saw my over made up face and tear, washed my face and put the whole new Verna makeup 
on and just, you know, became somebody else. So that moment of turning into Verna Ellers is probably, for me, at least the best film experience I've ever had. And when you hit this, you must have listened, watched other uh, interviews or else you're my twin. Because, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a horrible thing to have wished on anybody. But I think that when a fan follows an artist long mm -hmm. enough, I do feel, I don't feel like your twin, but I really do feel that I can intuit the moments in your career that were very meaningful to you. I think a good fan can do that. Well, okay. And let me just say right back. I think, a, and I'm not going to com uh, compliment myself by saying a good actress, but an actress's heart, the one that cares about that since she was 13, 14 years old, growing up in Boulder, Colorado, my heart knows too, and my soul even more, knows the same thing. I just say that I'm proud of that. I don't care if you like it or not, I'm proud of that. And I don't say that often. I'm, I have a very high, I don't know what. Uh, You're uh, your toughest critic. Well, I am that, but I also know when it's right. I know when it's right and I know when I'm reaching, I know when I'm uh, struggling. Uh, that it's not really home base, all these things. But when it strikes and I see the coin drop in the glass piggy bank, you drop a coin down a piggy bank and it, you see it drop and it clinks. I see it drop and clink very few times, but when I do, I'm proud of it. And you can say anything you want. I did what I set out to do. I think that's because it's magical and you're intuitive and you can tell when the magic happened. And yes, it was, yes. it's a, it really is a masterclass in acting. I'm so glad I got my chance to tell you that. How well, really I'm so fantastic. glad I had a chance to hear it. I want to ask you about Valine's friendship with Karen, the Michelle Lee character. It's so genuine and sincere. It's very relatable for the audience. I think it's one of the best portrayals of female friendship in the history of television. Oh, I wish Michelle were here beside me for, to, you know, to, to, respond to that because we from agree? day one we were doing the pilot in the cul-de-sac and Patrick Duffy I think was a guest star because Larry didn't want to do well then and Larry actually ended up doing quite a few but uh, Patrick was the first to say yes he would come and be in the pilot and Michelle said you know I've done two or three pilots you know I love this show I love this character but you know I've done two or three and nothing happened and I said Michelle and this is me being, I can't believe how strong it's going to happen. We're, this is going to work. This is going to go. And sure enough, there was. But Michelle and I, I think it may be the Broadway background because she's a Broadway baby without a doubt. It's that theater foundation and knowing the good stuff, the right stuff, many of the things you've mentioned. I think it's that coming to the fore and not so loud as that. And she and I shared that. And I love her to pieces, as I love Donna, because we're now working together to try to put something together called We're, well, it's a, a kind of a working title. We're not K-N-O-T done yet. Is it true that you never sat down and watched Knott's Landing when it aired on TV? No, I didn't. My husband did, but no, I So didn't. Joan, I have to tell you that if you had, you would have heard the coin drop into that glass many times. Oh, God, you gave me troubles with that one, too. I'm getting frostbite. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that, um, and then you left Knott's Landing after season 13 to star in Spin Doctors, which did not get picked up by NBC. And I have something else to tell you, for whatever it's worth. I think you were still right to leave the show when you did, because the Valine character was becoming increasingly unrealistic and a bit of a caricature. And frankly, the writing at that point was beneath you. I'm sorry, but I had to say it. No, but I, I wasn't aware of that. And I'm sure you're absolutely right. But I did know and hear rumors that, you know, this was the, the season 13, I think it was. But there were whispers that it, this, the network might drop us, you know, that we, we do. That's a long run. And I think we're the third longest still or somewhere in there, three or four, because uh, NCIS is going to, you know, go till the cows come home and then some. But we had heard rumors and there was this part that was what I always wanted to do was moxie, kind of a, and younger, uh, sorry, older woman, younger guy, and Chris Maloney, who would argue with that, 
so it was Chris Maloney playing opposite me and it was, it looked wonderful. And I was thinking that it, I won't say the agency, a very big one, didn't protect me in terms of if I do the pilot, you know, you have, there has to be some sort of guarantee or something, whatever. It was a snafu, but my fault completely in not insisting on knowing whether or not knots was done. And that wasn't done by the agency or whatever, or, or perhaps me, I'll take it. I'll take it. It was a foolish or a business move and Blondie's not good at business. Blondie just says, give me the script. I want to learn the lines. Let's do it. Let's do this. And so I lost, they were upset, of course, as they well should be. And I ended up doing guest roles and other things and coming back and directing a couple. And then came back, of course, for the final season in the, the final work on Knots. Would you ever do another long running TV series? That's a tough one because with the new normal and with Rusty Joan, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. That's a very good question, but I wouldn't know until it was the part and the effort to bring it. Uh, but you're open to it. Oh, yeah. Who wouldn't be? I mean, yes. But I sort of want to play. I desperate used to be I wanted to play a biker character, but, I, I, you know, something totally different. One of the things I want to bring up tomorrow is playing three character ladies instead of trying to glamour and the, the stuff we've been known for, surprise them, Un, do something unexpected. Three um, bag ladies, I don't know, something, something very different. And yes, then I would be just, you know, reaching, begging like a dog for a treat. I understand that you directed two episodes of Knott's Landing and you directed an ABC after school special called Boys Will Be Boys, The Ali Cooper Story. And in 1997, you directed a documentary on homelessness and domestic violence for the Directors Guild of America, which was nominated for an Emmy Award, I might add. Yeah. I want to know if you enjoy directing as much as acting. Oh, no, nothing tops acting. I, but I, you know, there's a, it's the other half, if I'm Gemini, it's the other half. It's the, when I'm taking care of something at the house, with, it's wearing big girl pants. And where the actress pants, to me, are the vulnerability and the sensitivity and the reaction versus action. Director is action, uh, actor is reacting. So I've thought a lot, but I haven't got in my head the way I do on acting roles. I haven't got in my head what kind of a piece of material or whatever, because I'd like to help create that. But I've thought more about what character could I do that would say, that's Joan Van Ark, what? Well, yeah, that's what I want. You know, Knott's Landing was one of the few TV shows that had three strong women. Mm -hmm. And you are close and very dear friends with Michelle Lee and Donna Mills. I was thinking maybe a reality show with the three of you. I think well, people would love that. Uh, the, the reality, the idea for a, a reality show is, is another one. And you, you know, the if you use the we're not done yet, K-N-O-T, as a sort of a, a subtitle or whatever, it, it should be about it, life forever is, is a challenge and a, a party and a, a funeral and, a, you know, respond to the age group that is now and give women or girls or a sense of try anything, do anything, don't give up, do, you know, a, a positivity pill yeah. and have fun and laugh. Whatever it is, I know we've got to, it's got to be a fun, bring the funny. We've got to bring the funny. We are known for the, you know, the drama and the tears and the, oh my goodness, and all that stuff. But no, enough with that. Let's try something, not silly, but sometimes silly, just light, 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 and funny. That's and my- poignant. Idea. You're what? very, very good at conveying poignancy, strength. Oh, yes, but I, I just think there, there are so many important older stories that we could do that is more age appropriate now for the three of us. And that would be great. I only have one more Knott's Landing question. Uh, of all the guest stars who appeared, the one who mesmerized me the most was Ava Gardner. I knew you were going to say that. Ruth I Galveston. Knew. That's who she played, Ruth Galveston. She was only in seven episodes. But tell us, Joan, what was she like to work with? Well, I had no scenes with her, so I could die over that. 
But you uh, could tell that I was going to mention Ava Gardner? Yes, I just knew because somehow it's getting scary now oh. because you're, 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 you're hitting, and maybe you've seen my old clips, you should pardon the expression, because not everyone's seen my old clips, but I'll show them, I'll show them to a few of you. Did we you get were to all, talk to her at all? Oh, yes, I did. I had to. I saw her the first day that she, that she came to work because I was getting made up to be filming the scene while she uh, gets made up with Bill Reynolds, our makeup man, Debbie Reynolds' brother. That was our makeup man for the first many several years, 10, maybe 10 plus years of Knott's Landing. We were all in there kind of all a little giddy and, uh, you know, a, excited that the one and only, the great Eva Gardner was going to come in. Suddenly the door, there's a really hard knock on the door. The door flies open and there she stands in men's khaki pants and a big man's business shirt, you know, pinstripes, just kind of like a guy almost and flat shoes, of course. She steps into the trailer and we're all, you know, starstruck and jaws dropping and in order to sort of fill the blank she says all right and she takes her man's shirt off turns it around and ties it around her back in a knot here just the bra strap showing flops into the chair and says let's get to work let's get to work and it sort of broke the ice because she it was almost like a performance but it, I will never, ever, ever forget it. And that's what she was there for, to do the work. And Bill was supposed to get going on it. And I tiptoed away from that chair, went down to get my hair done <laughs> and just sort of listened and participated in little bits. But I shared the makeup trailer with her the first day. That's uh, Otherwise, I was, Valine and her character, Ruth Galveston, we were blankets. Well, I'm still glad I asked you about her because I always wondered what she was like off the she uh, was, set. She was a pro. She knew what mattered. You know, the best ones are simple and, and giving ultimately when the time comes for when it's important, when it's action and deliver, giving, giving, sharing. It, it, she, was, she was a star. <laughs> In 1998, you played the first female vice president in a TV movie called Loyal Opposition, oh, Terror wow. in the White House. It only took 22 more years for a woman to finally be elected vice president. But you did it first on TV, Joan. That must make you proud. Well, I don't think I was the first. I bet you anything that other writers wanted to see that sooner than later. And it's coming very soon. It's coming. You know who I think it's going to be? And not, not a, a totally a wrong... Michelle Obama, I have a feeling that there, I just get that sense that, first of all, she has that kind of important guy as her shadow, who is, I can see that relationship. It's a little like Joan and Jack. It's just so supportive. There's just something magic I see. And I feel that, I don't know, there's something about her because she gets it, but she also gets it enough to know this might not be the greatest choice. So she would have reasons that are very valid and very respected, but there it's coming very soon. It's coming very soon. From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> and now I have to ask you this in 2013, you were a guest judge in three episodes of RuPaul's. RuPaul! Drag Race. <laughs> now that must have been a riot. You looked like you were having such a great time. Oh, well, first of all, he's, I adore him. And I got his book. He sent me his book. He's so complete. There's something, you know, you always just know, you obviously do because you get it big in steroid, but uh, with steroid, uh, <laughs> it's, you understand or you realize or you see or you sense uh, that. And he, he has that. I, I immediately loved him. And I still, of course, do. And he sends me, or all of us, I'm sure he has a list a mile long, uh, birthday and Christmas, uh, yes, Christmas gifts, pads and uh, mugs and all kinds of wonderful stuff. Yeah, that was a great, uh, a fun thing for your fans to see you do. And now I, I'm going to mention, you've mentioned it a few times, you're a long distance runner, you've done well over a dozen big marathons, 
You are on the cover of Runner's World magazine, 1983. I have it. When I look at how hard you've worked in your career, I don't know how you've ever had time to run. Oh, no. I, running is my glass of wine. Now, it used to be a bottle of champagne whenever I you know, felt that it, you need to calm down, Joan. Not now. If anything gets in my way, stop. Don't do it. Keep going. M move forward. Progress. You know, evolve. I do 10 to 12 miles every day in Toluca Lake, but I need that to chill. I'm way too mental. I need to reflect, and I call it flushing the toilet. When I go running, it takes away all the negativity. It helps me solve some things that I'm not quite sure about. Or what. It's my own time. Maybe it's a kind of meditation. I don't know. I pray too. It fills my soul. It's soul food. I know that one of your favorite quotes is a line from Camino Real by Tennessee Williams. Make God, voyages. You must have been reading others. You're uncanny. You're, you're scaring me. I make, mean, make voyages. Attempt them. There is nothing else. And right. I, I, I just want to tell you, I think you've been doing that your whole life. Well, maybe, but hold on, because I have to get something. Since you mentioned that, you're the first person on the planet, and I've done six billion interviews. Hold one second. Talk amongst yourselves, sisters, all right? Hold okay. on. Okay. Well, there's a reason I've been doing that my whole life, and it's this quote that you just gave, make voyages, attempt them, there is nothing else. My favorite director at Williamstown Theater Festival where people like Christopher Reeve and Diane Weist and amazing, amazing actors would go and work out for a couple of weeks, uh, rehearse a couple of weeks, and then do the show for a couple of weeks. That was this director, Nico Sakharopoulos. That was his favorite quotes. And he would often cast characters. Blythe Danner went there with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow almost every summer doing some production. But that was his quote, and he would have those actors do characters and parts and things. Christopher Reeve would play the ugly, uh, I don't know what, professor or boyfriend or whatever, but against type. And that, to me, make voyages attempt them, there is nothing else, means the courage of the actor to throw away what might be his silhouette, his profile, his trademark, or her hers as the case may be and and try something new and that's what we would go to Williamstown and do so I love that phrase I love you for bringing it up yeah I love that about you I think that you really you actually walk the talk you really oh, live by that motto well I did I'm not a I, I've never thought of it that way it's just I took a chance uh, actually a, a couple of weeks ago in that respect I don't know, this is really, uh, I had this squamous cell thing removed on my nose, uh, going in for just a regular checkup and he saw this and he said, I'm gonna biopsy this and whatever. It turns out it's squamous cell cancer. So bang, off it went. And a, a big long incision on my shin, I get down to the car after he's done taking it off and it's a big hole in my nose, which is still there. I have yet to decide how I'm gonna fix it. I get down to the car and my manager has left a message. You have an audition tomorrow for a running character in a pilot coming up tomorrow. There, here's a bandage on my nose. It's uh, my whole part of my face is covered and my shin is all bound up. And I've got it. I, we talked them into waiting a, another week and I tried it anyway, because I thought this is a character that's, you know, what you've been describing as it's something. And what I've been describing in a way something different and she's a new york hard ass wonderful and i should have gotten a wedge haircut i know exactly what she should have been so it, it was awful and they even asked for another one the, the few days later which i had to record a, a project that is upcoming that i can't talk about because we all have to sign disclosure contracts yeah a, a full disclosure we will not talk about it said she talking about it. bottom line is i was doing that the day before so i was just as wiped out the day we redid it bottom line is if it's an acting part and it's a challenge for me i suit up and show up so maybe and that's bad that's i i think it is i don't know no um, i think because you believe in destiny and because you are so intuitive if it's meant to happen it will. And Thank that's, you. that Thank is going to heal. And there's wonders with makeup. I believe 
that you are K-N-O-T not finished. No, not I'm done. not. I, no, but God love you because those are all the things if I pray, those are the positivity and power and all those things because it's, this is a tricky time. It depends on what work you do and what your passion is and what you love and what you're here for because I believe it's like our marriage or Gary and Val. If you tear a piece of paper in half, you might find another half somewhere that is uh, okay and it'll sort of fit. But if you find the one that's the other half of your paper, it fits. It fits and it's right. And it's what God or someone or something said is destiny, is, is what it was supposed to be. So I believe in that in relationships and uh, marriages, of course, and parts that you do or don't get. You have to just say, then I was protected from something, something I don't know, and maybe this was better this way. But it, my heart's broken usually for a week. <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned your marriage. You married your high school sweetheart, John Marshall, in 1966. You have had one of the longest and most successful marriages in Hollywood history. What's the secret to such a long, happy marriage? Well, I don't know. My husband, when he's asked that very same question because of our long running marriage, uh, he says a gradual hearing loss and uh, frequent separation because I so often have to go on location and so I'm gone. So frequent separations and gradual hearing loss is the secret to, <laughs> to a long marriage. And I'm sure it's true. Dolly Parton, I don't think she's ever home. God bless her. And she's she's amazing. She's amazing. Oh. The energy, the every bit of her is, I love her. I love her. She's a, not a survivor by any means. She's because she's at the, she's the captain. But she she's guided by some magnificent star. And oh, <laughs> God and bless you, her. Uh, God uh, bless her. But, and you share her optimism. You have that same glow. Well, In fact, uh, because of that, I wanted to ask if you have any advice for young people who aspire to go into show business. What would you say? I would say the best thing is get into a class that is a performance situation, which I have attended in Beverly Hills, the Beverly Hills Playhouse, and do any theater, no matter what the size, no matter if it's 10, 12, 15 seats, or whatever it is, so you build a process. You have to learn your way and your path and your way to deliver a, a character and a performance sooner than later. And the minute you have some of that put together in auditions or whatever you're doing, you'll have a foundation to stand on. But you have to have training a bit, not too much to inhibit you. Have training and get into any little theater or community theater, which was my case. Just be out there and doing what an actor does, no matter what the level of the venue is, do it and build your process. I have only one question left. But it's really important to me. Joan, do you really get, I mean, deep down inside, do you get how talented and gifted you are and how beloved you are by your fans? Not at all. <laughs> I, I mean, that's, I, that's a beautiful question and a beautiful thought because it would empower anybody to go anywhere. But I just, I'm grateful for any and every heart that you know feels might feel that way but i'd love to make a funny or a joke because i just you're only as good as your last performance in a way and i'm an actor who started way back and have always had the report card and the report card is usually the performance and or the reaction when i did the diary of anne frank at the nomad playhouse where i started at 14 and i did anne frank people would come back stage in tears and just be hugging me well that was plenty that and i'm not i would not want to drive anybody to tears now they cry because oh my god what's happened to me but it's like <laughs> it's like what what matters is the work the character and the message of the play most important the message of the play did you give that to them did did they get that from you that's what counts and when you have less of that you don't know your report card and you don't know how to deliver that extraordinary feeling of 
I give this to you. I give it to you from my heart to yours or ha 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 from my heart to yours. Well, I have to disagree when you say that you're only as good as your last performance, because I think this interview has proven when you look at the body of work, so much of which is captured on film in so many of the TV movies I mentioned, not just Knott's Landing, there is a lot of Joan Van Ark out there that can dazzle us, that we can learn from, that educates, inspires, entertains. So I think it's a huge body of work that creates an enormous report card. And as far as I'm concerned, baby, it's an A+. plus. Oh, well, uh, you're, you're gorgeous, and you are. I don't know, even know. I just say thank you, like a gracious lady. <laughs> well, Miss Joan Van Ark, I have to tell you that it has been absolutely magical getting to interview you. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. I'll never forget your kindness in doing this for us. Okay, I have something I want to see if I can show you. Can you see, if I get out of the way, you, do you see the, what that is behind me, those lights? The XO, yes. Yes. Uh, I saw that at an antique store that I was running by and bought it. But that's what I'm sending to you and your viewers, listeners, however I may be coming over the airwaves too. <laughs> There's an X and an O from Joan to you. Thank you so, so much. And when you star in that new reality show, which I have a feeling is going to happen, will you promise to come back on our show, please? Oh, absolutely. But I want my girlfriends with me. I, obviously, that would be great for you, you too. But I want my girlfriends, my sisters, I call them sisters, Michelle and Donna, we're, we're, the three of us should come back together and, and, and rave and get you to watch whatever we become a part of. Absolutely. Michelle and Donna are more than welcome on the show. Please give them my love. I and, will. Uh, our show. I is, see them tomorrow. <laughs> oh, please tell them I would love to have them come on the show. Okay. Our guest has been the multi-talented and iconic actress, Joan Van Ark. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.